Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to Acts chapter 10. When you get there, we're going to pick up in verse 34 where we left off last time. And the title of our Bible study today is Generational Change. Jesus saves a family. And that's what happens when a man or a woman is born again. It equals generational change. Of course, it starts in the home and then it extends to kids and grandkids and to aunts and uncles, but then also generations after us will be benefited, and also generations before us that are still alive will benefit from salvation entering in to our house. And we left off last time in the book of Acts here in chapter 10 with Peter in the house of Cornelius. It was startling for Peter to be in the house of Cornelius because there was a great separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was a great exclusion of the Gentiles by the Jews, but that's not God's heart. And you need to realize that there are times when men are involved with religion that don't reflect the heart of God. And God's heart is revealed in his Bible. And from the very beginning in Genesis, it's clear that the gospel is to go to all the world, the Gentiles included. And they, by the time we get to the book of Acts and the lifetimes of Jesus and now after They had left the heart of God completely. But God, through the church, is going to bring it back. And Peter is one of the men that God used in a wonderful way to serve this guy by the name of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. He had a lot of strikes against him, but not in the eyes of God. Pick up with me in verse 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by God. I want you to pause there for a moment, and I want you to circle the word there in verse 34, partiality. Very important word, and it's super important coming from the lips of Peter. Partiality, the the regular dictionary, Webster's, defines it this way. Partiality is an unfair bias in favor of one thing or person compared to another. Another word for partiality would be showing favoritism. Another word that you could use together with partiality would be prejudice, where in order to show partiality, you have to be prejudiced. You have to prejudge someone so that you can show them favoritism or an unfair bias. And in the world we live, in the culture we're in, there is much partiality. There is a lot of prejudice and bias and favoritism. Some people are looked down upon because of where they live or the size of their bank account or the country they were born in or their immigration status or a host of other things, the color of their skin. It's divisive and it's hurtful and it's sinful and it's not okay. And sometimes, unfortunately, it takes root in the church. I'm not naive enough to think that there aren't people among us right now, either in the room or online or listening on the radio right now, that are not prejudiced and maybe don't even care. But I'm telling you, if you're a born-again believer in Christ, you need to care. It is hindering you from being used by God. It is separating you from the people that God has called you to serve and to minister to and to share the gospel. I mean, the theme of our study through the book of Acts has been, be the church, And if you really want to be, it's not like your identity is not. If you're born again, you are the church. But if you want to really live that out, then you're going to have to deal with this issue of prejudice where it exists in your life. You know, it's like a a cook. You know, a cook cook that's that's using knives, you know, if if the knife's not sharp, it's it's not really helpful. And so there's, you know, those, the chefs and cooks among us that are constantly sharpening their knives because the knife is better when it's sharp. It actually works for you. And I I think of that in light of your usability. Like if if you want to be used of God, 
then you want to be sharp. If you want to be more usable for God, then you want to identify those things that are doling your ability to connect with other people. And I'm telling you, one of the top ones is this issue of partiality and prejudice. And even just saying the word makes people uncomfortable, but that's just the reality. It's not okay for believers to be prejudiced. It's period. It's not okay. If you're, if you're unconvinced, I'm going to take you through, looking at this episode in life of Peter, I'm going to take you through various passages of the Bible to just let the Bible say what it says. Let me give you the first one in, Gen- in Proverbs chapter 28, in verse 21. It says this, to show partiality is not good. Is that clear enough? Proverbs 28, showing partiality is not good because for a piece of bread, a man will transgress. God has been dealing with this issue in Peter. It's going to be an issue in his life. I asked you to read ahead last time to the book of Galatians because this is going to be an issue that Peter deals with in his life. And anyone that's ever come face to face with this particular sin, you know, you're not immediately delivered from it. Like you, you, it starts with repentance and brokenness and humility, and then God begins to work in your life to value people the way that he values them, to value people from every walk of life, every appearance, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, so that we see people the way that Jesus does. And for Peter, it required this vision that he got. God was preparing him and training him, and he received this vision when he was at the rooftop of a man by the name of Simon, who happened to be a tanner. And even being in the tanner's house, no doubt had to be challenging for Peter because the tanner's dealing with dead carcasses, animal carcasses, which is forbidden for a Jewish person to be near. Not supposed to touch them. So he's all over. He's in the house. Like God is taking him little by little away from his past and into a new glorious future of grace and transformation. And here he is, he receives this vision of animals in a sheet, and the voice told him, go ahead and eat them. You were with us last time we learned Peter's response was, no way, I'm not going to eat them. I don't eat anything unclean. And we learned that the essence of the teaching of that vision was very simple. The follow-up was, "What, what God has called clean, don't you call unclean. And that's how it ended. And then he gets these messengers. He takes off from Joppa down to Caesarea. And somewhere on that journey, it was revealed to him that the whole thing in his dream and everything was not about animals. It was about people. What I call clean, don't you call unclean. You, you, you know, what that would equate to today is that every human being is created in the image of God. They bear his image. Jesus would put it this way. He summed up the whole law in relationship to God this way. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor. Your neighbor created in the image of God, no matter what their background is, no matter where they come from, what they're dealing with, not to show partiality. And here, as Peter opens his mouth in verse 34, I, I love where he's at because he, he's at a very simple place in life. Sometimes we complicate our relationship with God way too much. He is where he needs to be. He is where we need to be, and that's this. He's just simply obeying what's in front of him. You want, hey, I got this visitor. Yeah, come to my house. I'll come to your house. What am I doing here? The angel said you have something to say. All right, I guess I have something to say. He opens his mouth, and this is what he shares. A very simple presentation of the gospel, the good news that today your sins can be forgiven. You listening to this message from Peter 2,000 years ago has the power to change your life today. That God today in this room and watching online and listening on the radio somewhere around the country, even around the world, listening on your phone, on a walk, wherever you are, God shows no partiality. It doesn't matter where you've come from, what you've been into, what kind of sinful, what what kind of life you've lived in sin, apart from God, resistant to God, having great animosity toward God. It doesn't matter what your background is. God shows no partiality that today, if you respond to the gospel, that Jesus lived for you, died for you, and rose again the third day, you too will be saved. 
The gospel is for everyone listening to me right now. Just like it was with Peter. And so again, notice what he says. Here it is. He says in verse 35, but in every nation, now pause there for a second. We'll, get, we'll, go, we'll go forward, but I, I need to point things out to you so you don't miss them. Don't miss the word every nation. Because this is what Peter has, God has been dealing with Peter about. So when he says every nation, he means it. The, the whole world has been open to Peter right now. It is, the gospel is not just for the Jewish people. It is for every nation. And this is big for him. He already knows the gospel. He shared it over in the beginning of the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost there in Jerusalem. Now he is many miles away from Jerusalem in this town known as Caesarea by the sea in the house of this Gentile with all the Gentiles, fam- Cornelius' his family and friends are packing out the house and he looks at them and he says, hey, every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he's the Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, And they began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Verse 40. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, again, notice the word, whoever believes in him will receive the forgiveness of sin. From a simple place of obedience, Peter is used greatly. He is moving away from this ingrained partiality and prejudice that was taught to him from a young age. It was taught to him within the system of religion he was born into. And yet Jesus broke that cycle. He broke that cycle in Peter's life. He's going to break that cycle right now in Cornelius' life. And God wants to break that cycle in your life. I know it's a very humbling thing. I recognize that. I affirm that. To come face to face with a new truth that's clearly in the Bible, but then have to deal with the way you were raised or taught growing up. Like you have, it's a humbling thing, especially as we get older, to admit that there are things that we just believe that are wrong, that we have to unlearn. You never want to take the approach with the Bible, friend. You never want to take the approach where you read something clearly and then someone explains it away because of some religious system. I mean, it says what it says. It's pretty clear. It's like this. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Like, well, that's only a certain group. The only, whoever's only for a certain group. Well, what are you talking about? Earlier, Peter said that it's every nation. So the certain group is everyone. Past, present, and future. And what happens is, is the farther you follow a religious system away from the Bible, the more important the religious system becomes and the less important the Bible becomes. But I'm telling you right now, only the Bible is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Only the Bible is alive and can speak to the very issues in your life. Peter having after spent three years with Jesus, is still learning new things and growing in his understanding of what the truth is. And there he is. This is huge for him. And I think God wants to do huge things in your life, bringing you to from glory to glory and strength to strength. But this is huge. This is a big problem for Peter and the Jewish people of the first century. But the Lord's working with him, leading him, doing what's necessary to get his attention to cause them to think differently and to be open to the truth and then to follow the truth. Jesus was not partial, and Peter knew this. He saw it. Peter, Jesus didn't show partiality. I mean, you think of peop- the people that Jesus met and hung out with. 
Jesus served people in his ministry of three years in all sorts of conditions, from all sorts of backgrounds. Jesus ministered to Jews. He ministered to Gentiles, other centurions and others. He ministered to Samaritans, which would be the group that was avoided the most by the Jewish people. He served military. He served leaders. He served the rich. He served the poor. You name it. Jesus was around people so much that they began to accuse him of being a sinner like everyone else. He had so much time with the people that needed him. Remember that time Jesus came and he says, you know what? Those that are well, they don't need a physician. It's the ones that are sick. And Jesus hung out with the sick, both spiritually and physically. But one thing you'll never read of Jesus ever doing is sinfully prejudging someone. He received them as they were and treated them as the humans they were. He built a bridge, if you will, the language we might use today is he stepped into their lives, built a bridge to them so that they would trust him and he could serve them. And he even served and healed people that never thanked him, didn't care, and probably still died in their sins. And yet he loved them and served them. This is a big deal, especially in the days in which we live. It is a big deal for the church to deal with this sin to come face to face and to be real about it and be open. If you're praying through Psalm 139 where we're praying to God, hey, search me and know me and try me. Is there any unclean, reveal any unclean thing in me? This is one of the things you should pray for. Because if you can overcome this hurdle, if it exists in your life, then you will be so much more usable in the culture you're in right now to prejudge or the idea of looking down the nose at someone, looking down the nose at someone. You know what? The problem, the root of it, besides sin, the root of prejudice is we just think we're better than people. That's all. We just think we're better. They have some condition that's different, some issue that's different, some background that's different. We then compare them by what we are, and we look down on them. We think we're higher in an elevated place. We believe that, hey, you know what? They might need to look at them and look at them and it's not what I've done. And, and here's what Jesus said. Again, as we go through, consider this. Jesus said this in John 7, verse 24. Do not judge according to outward appearance. It couldn't be clear. Don't judge according to appearance, but judge with a righteous judgment. And you know, the only righteous judgment we can have is in the Lord. He, even in the message that Peter teaches, it talks about him being the judge of the living. So we trust him to sort out the things that we see in people's life. Again, if you go back to verse 34, next to the word partiality in your Bibles, you can also write this phrase that might help you remember this word. It says, another way of understanding from the original language, from the Greek, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. The Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew and a couple of places in the language of Aramaic. But here in the New Testament, the Greek word has the idea of judging by the face. And what that means is that you see someone and then you assess them and think you know everything about them and make a judgment. Judging by the face, kind of like a face-to-face encounter. You, you, You judge them by the face. And so basically what's being said here is don't judge people that way. Don't judge them by the face. You don't know everybody's story. You just don't know. You think you know but you don't know. And you'll never know until they share it with you. So when you come to a conclusion before someone shares their story with you, no wonder they don't want to hear the gospel. No wonder you have no credibility in their life. When you start posting things and saying things about your own personal opinions that put other people down, no wonder the gospel has no power in your life. Your opinions are pretty popular, but they don't point to the saving grace of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ isn't, as we were even singing earlier, the blood of Jesus Christ isn't elevated because people can't get past your opinion. And it's very serious today. And I believe God wants us to be usable. He he wants us to step into people's lives. I was telling a group not too long ago, and I shared it also with our at our last huddle. Uh, where we gather the servants together, like the, one of the big tools that's going to be used in our generation right now in this, this season to reach others is this tool of empathy. Empathy. And when you think about empathy, you're like, well, that's relating to someone in the difficulty of their life. 
Yes. And the only way you're going to find that out is if you listen to them and value their story and value their background. You know how someone's sharing with you and they've got some really difficult stuff in their life and automatically you just want to correct them, you want to change them, you want to, no, 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 that, that doesn't work. It, it, st- it makes people defensive. It, it, it actually, that m- mindset repels instead of just letting someone share their story from where they're at so that there's a bridge to be built and credibility shared so that you can begin to share your story. Because your story is going to involve an encounter with Jesus. Your story is going to involve an encounter of transformation, of forgiveness. And as you hear people's stories, you know, you'll be surprised to find out we all have pretty much a common story. Sin has jacked up our lives. It's different. Some of us, got, <laughs> some of us experienced it far more than others. But sin has wrecked humanity. And it's just the different ways that it's wrecked humanity that, that has separated us. Prejudice, partiality divides us. It doesn't unite us. It's a familiar tool of the devil. Why? Because I believe the devil believes Jesus when he taught. He believes him. And the Bible indicates that, that even the, dem, the, the, the demons tremble, but they don't believe they understand, they don't believe for salvation, but they understand that what Jesus is saying is the truth. And Jesus said that a house divided cannot stand. He didn't say maybe won't stand, might not stand. He said it pretty clear, it won't stand. And you can see not only from the Tower of Babel in the Bible, but all the way back to the Garden of Eden. As soon as sin entered into the picture, rebellion against God, the division started and it hasn't ended. And it won't end until Jesus returns and builds his kingdom among us. Other passages that you can refer to, uh, if this is something you want to meditate on, Deuteronomy chapter 10 in verse 17 says, God shows no partiality. Second Chronicles 19 verse 7 says, God shows no partiality. Job chapter 34 verse 19 says that God is not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor. Anything we are and everything we are is only because of the grace of God. Let me say that again. Anything we are, everything we are is only because of what Jesus has done in our lives. That's it. You don't respond with that in your mind or even out loud. No, no, pastor, you don't know me. You don't know my background. You don't know where I came from. I'm a self-made man. You are not a self-made man. As hard work as you might have done and all the effort you might have put in it, you are not self-made. You are made by the grace of God. The very breath in your mouth and your lungs has been given to you by God. As hard as you might be and as smart as you might be and as far in advance you are in your career or how much money you made or how you got yourself, you know, whether God met you in a high rise as a CEO millionaire or he met you a homeless on the street, it is by the grace of God. Everybody saved the same way, by the grace of God. <clears throat> the grace of God is experienced through faith, right? It's by grace through faith. All of us. And it's important that we remember that. It's so much so, it's not self-made. So much so that the Bible would even add to it in case there's any uh, question that it's not, it's, you are saved by grace through faith, not of works. Why? So that nobody will boast. And here's the essence, okay? And, and, and here's what Peter's dealing with, what he's gotten through. And I, I love how quickly he got through it. Because he got the vision, and he's wrestling with all that, but somewhere on that journey from Joppa to Caesarea, it clicked. And he understood, this is what God's doing in my life. This is what he wants for my life. This is why I'm ready. Let's do it. And, and what, he, what clicked was that God has sent his gospel to every human being. Every man, woman, and child that can understand, no matter the background, including you today including you that might have been marginalized or made fun of or ridiculed or prejudiced against you or you're prejudiced, everyone, rich or poor, smart, smarter, not so smart, all the different categories we give ourselves. 
The gospel comes to you today. And Jesus invites you to himself to receive the forgiveness of sin and be free from the pain and the power of sin. To live a life that you've always wanted by faith in him. But don't come to the house of God and think that it is all you. And it's because of you. And it's because of your work ethic or you work so hard or it's all. No, the, the root of that separation really is you just stop thinking you're better than others. There's no room for a I'm better than you attitude in the church because anything we are is because of what Jesus has done. So who makes any of us better than anyone else? And we all have our struggles and we all have our issues, but it doesn't make us any better or worse. It's life. In the Bible, we're told not to do that specifically, explicitly, not to do that. And this is where genuine faith and living faith and growing faith really comes alive, where you realize you're not just part of some Sunday morning church club where you get all dressed up and show up and we do our religious duty. Who wants to live like that? I want to be used in people's lives. I want to help people. I want to point them to the Lord. I want to do good. You know, because the, the, the church is not the only group that does good in the world. There's a lot of good, a lot of philanthropy, a lot of charities. But the church is the only ones that do good for the name of Jesus Christ. Now, now listen, the, the philanthropy and the charity in the world, typically the motive of doing good is not only to help, but, but because it makes them feel good. It makes them feel good. Yeah, we're going to help, but it really makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I have purpose in life. It makes me feel like my life matters. And, and as good as a motive that is, it's still a very low-level motive. The church, the believers of Christ do, it's very different. Because, you know, in charity outside of Christ, it's like, I'm going to do good and it's going to always make me feel good. But as a believer in Christ, you realize that when you do good for someone, it is to make them feel good, not you. It is in the honor of Jesus and what he's done in your life. You want someone to have a taste of that. You want someone to to sense just a little taste of God that it might lead to something else, that it might be done in Jesus' name, the authority of Jesus. And, And many times you have learned this, that sometimes, many times, doing good for others actually is gonna make you feel bad because sacrifice hurts. Sacrifice hurts. It's not just a little bit, a little bit, like, Believers have been taught to give sacrificially. And that's sometimes a painful process, especially if you love your money, <laughs> especially if you think it's all yours, especially if you think I'm self-made, so I'll do it. Like, it's a painful process for you to get to that place where you realize that others are more important than you and that we're to think of others more highly than ourselves. These are the Christian attributes that God is building in us right now. They've been given to us by faith and the Holy Spirit came upon us. Jesus wants, he doesn't want some ritual. He doesn't want some religious routine in our lives. He doesn't want you to live your own life, realize, hey, it's not as good as it can be. Hey, I heard I can go to church. I'll be good for my family. My kids will be in Sunday school so I can be the same exact person I've always been and just call myself a Christian. What a low level way to live. And then you never really even know If you're truly born again or not, you have no assurance in your heart. But a person that's born again, listen, the Bible says a person that's born again becomes a new creation in Christ. All things pass away and all things become new. And God's doing a new work through believers. And you can see as you live out these attributes of the Holy Spirit, you might find yourself in Cornelius' house in a very uncomfortable place that you've never been before, but because of the, the stability and the strength of God, you're going to do what he asks you to do wherever you are. Maybe that place for you is the cubicle that you're going to go to in the morning or later tonight. Very uncomfortable, very difficult place, and yet God is going to establish you there. It could be in the classroom, in the public schools, and the difficulties we're seeing all throughout our culture. Maybe it's in a police car as you're driving around the city wondering, What's next and what difficulty am I getting? Maybe it's going to be on a fire truck or as a paramedic in an ambulance or on a UPS truck or a FedEx truck or an Amazon truck, all over the, all over the community. The power of God is with you as you value people in the name 
of Jesus. So here in verse 43, it says, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sin. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that's another phrase for the Jews that were with him. Remember, Peter brought somebody, brought people with him. So there, Peter is with some folks there. Those who believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized and who receive the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked them to stay there a few days. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing the Gentile Pentecost. You remember earlier on in the book of Acts, Peter uh, has that opportunity to preach the gospel. Thousands get saved when the, pen, when the Holy Spirit comes upon those that were waiting in Jerusalem in obedience to Jesus. Now, years later, he's in Cornelius' house, and the generational change for all of the Gentile world started right here in this man's house. This God-fearer, this man who did good deeds. I, I want you, the church sometimes comes against things there's a couple things here that the church has made a big deal that are not big deal. First of all is this sense of, of how people are saved, right? I, even on my pulpit here, just to remind me every time I'm here, and I'll share it with you now, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because confession is made unto salvation, it says. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. But I want you to notice here that salvation took place without any confession. Do you guys see that? Peter is still talking. Boom, the Holy Spirit comes upon that Cornelius, his family, and everyone there. And the question has to be, why? And I'll tell you why. Because God acknowledged the belief that was in their hearts. They haven't yet confessed Jesus, but they will. Confession is part. Like it's, it's not possible to be born again and not tell anybody about it. It's impossible. Like, like you have to tell people, not because you have to like it's mandatory, but because it's inside of you. You can't help but tell people what God has done in your life. The confession's going to come. But you know, people make in the church, they like to argue about all kinds of things. They're like, well, you know, you're not doing it right. You know, God doesn't use altar calls and God doesn't use sinners' prayers and all that. And I'm like, like my, my, my response is like, you know, God doesn't really care what you think. He's going to save however he wants to save. Like if he wants to pour the Holy Spirit down just to blow Peter's mind and they're ready to be saved. Like they're ready. They're right on the edge. And if he wants to use altar calls, great, we'll do that. If he wants to lead people in prayer, great, we'll do that. If he wants to save somebody in their car while they're crying on the side of the road, great, God will do that. And who are we to come up with all these, these rules you have to follow? And you got to do it this way. You're not doing it right, pastor. Well, I hope I am. I hope I am. By pointing you to Jesus Christ and believing he's sufficient to know you, and your response to his death and resurrection for your life. I hope I am. And I think over the years I've witnessed enough of real genuine change in people's life that God is using me that way. But you're not doing it right. I don't know. I don't think you're thinking right, actually. Well, you have to do it this way. And they have to become members. And they have to take a test. And they have to... Like, I don't want you to just trust that they'll follow Jesus. And trust that you'll respond to that. Like some right now, right now, listening to me, in your heart, you're bursting with belief. You don't need to wait for me to do anything here. God could save you right now. Just tell him. In your heart of hearts, you don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to speak out loud. You know, that's a big secret in the Christian world right now, right? You don't have to speak out loud to have all kinds of things speaking in your head. You know that by now. Like you can talk under your breath. Real conversation. I think of Nehemiah. Nehemiah prayed to God, never said a word out loud. He spoke to God personally. 
Now, when you say it out loud, it helps us. <laughs> so we know you. You know, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So speaking out loud is definitely, it's definitely the right thing to do, but you can speak in your mind too. And so salvation took place here in Corn- with Cornelius and his family. Everyone that believed got saved, number one. There's another thing here that I see, and that is, Cor- remember Cornelius, he was a moral, religious man that did good deeds. That's how he was upright. He gave of alms. Uh, he prayed to God. Remember when we learned that? And then he get this, this visitation and said, your prayers and alms have been brought before God for a memorial. And today we might use the word, people might use the word, but Cornelius was a seeker. He was a seeker. He was seeking God. He wasn't quite there, but he was seeking God. But there are those in the church that make a big deal about that. And it's like, you're not a seeker. There's no such thing as seeker. The Bible says no one seeks God. No one. Yeah, but, you know, use the Bible correctly. If you don't want to say Cornelius was seeking God, then use another word. But what else can describe this man who wanted God so much, but the people with the truth didn't let him? There's a lot of people like that in your life. They want God so much and they are so close. But religion and religious people have stopped them. Why not you be the person that brings them all the way? Why don't you be the person that responds to the heavenly vision? Why not? uh, Like, why? I I just, like, you know, Cornelius comes to church here. You know, uh, pastor, I'm just seeking God. And I open the Bible. No, no, no. There is none that seeks God, Cornelius. Let's get that straight right now. All right, bro, I will go somewhere else. Somebody comes and says, you know, I'm just thinking about God. I want to follow God. And then what happens? Partiality and prejudice comes because you look at their life and you go, that doesn't seem like you're really seeking God. But then you don't make room for addiction. You don't make room for like bad mistakes and sinful mistakes. Like, Like a lot of times God uses all the brokenness as we read in the psalm, all the hurt in your life right now, all the the life-crushing experiences that you have lived with for years to draw you to himself. So you want to come in and say you're a seeker? Great. You want to come in and say you're looking for God? Great. I say good. I say you've come to a building that represents the very presence of God and you've heard a message already about the sacrificial life that Jesus gave for you. And you can respond to that belief. Let me give you a third thing in this section. This could be its own Bible study, but I I didn't want to develop it that way. But let me give you a third thing here in this text, and that's this. Water baptism happens to believers. Do you see, Peter didn't come into the house, tell Cornelius as a part of the gospel that the only way you to be saved is to get water baptized. I I know, unless you're thinking of it, you may not see it, but that's why I want you to see it. The Holy Spirit was given salvation has happened, then they're water baptized. Why is that important? Because again, there are those today that would say that a person is not saved unless they are water baptized. And then there's another sliver where they say, there are those that say, it's not just water baptism that saves you, but you must be water baptized by us, whoever that us might be. The church, the organization, the ministers, whoever. And the phrase for that, thinking, uh, the theological word for that is, is baptismal regeneration. That it's actually water baptism that saves or regenerates a person. Why is that important? Because if somebody comes and wants to talk you out of it, it's like, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized here? You're like, well, I, mean, I would think I was, I was baptized in the Aurora Reservoir. Oh, the waters of Aurora Reservoir could never save you. You know how dirty that is? You know, and on and on and on they go. It's like silly. Well, no, you were already saved. Baptism is an outward work, of a, an outward show of an inward work. It doesn't save you. As a matter of fact, if you think it saves you, that, like understand this, just understand this. I know one thing that happens when an unbeliever goes into the waters and gets baptized. I know that. Without faith, without belief, and they get baptized. You know what happens to them? They get wet. And that's it. And the Aurora Reservoir doesn't save you. The Aurora City municipal water that we fill these tubs here on Wednesdays doesn't save you. Only God saves you. And it's not by works. Or later on, Titus, not by works of righteousness. You're not saved by works. You're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
And who can be saved? Everyone and anyone that will come to him in humble repentance will receive the remission of sins. And what happens? The Holy Spirit comes in you. The Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you become a new person. And you want to follow through and be baptized. And that's happened, it happened in Cornelius' life. God interrupted this whole thing and said, it's time. It's time. I, I sense their belief. They're saved. And the people that were with him in verse 45, it says they were astonished. Peter's not astonished, but why? Because Peter was prepared for this. They weren't. This is what God used to get them. But God already been working on Peter, which reminds me and should help us because we do this in the church too. And that is we just think some people are more important than others. We don't think I'm as important as others. And, you know, God values individuality. He knows you by name. And he knows, like, if you might look at someone and compare yourself to them, well, you know, they're way ahead of me and I'm here. But you have your own path, your own road of discipleship following Jesus. So, yeah, some people are going to be advanced, but it doesn't make them better. Some people might learn faster. It doesn't make them better. Some people might get it. You might be astonished a lot more than Peter. It doesn't, none of those things matter. Nobody's better than anyone in the body of Christ. What, what the cross did was bring us all back to the place before sin. I'm going, I'm no, I'm no better than you. But Ed, look at you, you're a pastor. That, that is not how God sees me. He sees me as his son. I'm his son, you're his daughter. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. It, being in the role that I am doesn't make me any more important. But it does give me a lot more responsibility. I'm going to answer to God for a lot more. But that's what he called. He equipped me and prepared me. And that's what I'm going to do. And the final thought I want today before we leave. And I know that sometimes we have muscle memory uh, when it comes to church. So I'm gearing up in a few moments. I'm going to pray and say amen. And then that moves a lot of people to leave right away. So I don't want you to, because Pastor Ian is going to introduce a brand new song that he and I have been talking about for some time now, about the goodness of God. And many times the last song in a worship service, it, it doesn't end with my amen, and it doesn't begin when I hand in the pulpit. The, the, your worship of God began the moment you woke up today and you started reorienting your life toward the Lord on Sunday. It's a great way to do it. It's something we should do every day. But it doesn't end where you just take off. And I know, uh, you know, that might, you might need to get your kids or the parking lot might be full and all. I get that. But don't, you can retrain your muscle memory so that that last song gets deposited in your heart for this week. And I've noticed in the last few years, there's been a great emphasis in songs being written about the goodness of God. And you need that during the week. You need that in trial. You need that in difficulty. You need to remember that God is good. And this song is so beautiful. It's, it's, it's a blessing. And so as I wind down here and the muscle memory is starting to prepare and you're thinking the Chipotle burrito is in your mind right now. Like, I'm, I, well, should I get brown rice or white rice? I don't know. Okay, just put it on pause. Put it on pause. But here's the thing I want to show. Cornelius is experiencing generational change here. His life and home will be forever changed generationally. And why is that important? Because Cornelius' faith affected your life 2,000 years ago. That's how generational change works. Cornelius is a Gentile. 99.9% .9 of us here today are Gentiles. And so the door opening up for the gospel with Cornelius, it was God's will that through Cornelius' testimony in life that the gospel would explode to the Gentiles, of which you are. And so I don't know how it works in heaven. I know we have our thoughts of when we get to heaven, we're going to get in line and talk, hey, I want to meet David. So there's a long line for David. I want to meet Moses, a long line. Don't forget Cornelius when you get to heaven. And you show up and you thank him and his family for their faithfulness. You thank him for seeking God when nobody would let him. You thank him for obeying the heavenly vision and inviting Peter into his life, allowing Peter to share. You thank him for the testimony that he has in the Bible that has led to your salvation and mine. Because generational change, it's true for you too. God wants to do a work in your home and in your family. You may not see it. Cornelius never saw you get saved. You may not see it. 
So be careful with all the outward appearances and just do and be who God has made you to be and do. And he'll honor that. And I know it's hard to see generational change in your current situation, I know. But you trust God on this. It started with you. You brought salvation and the message of love into your household, into your broken family, to your divorced parents, to your kids and grandkids, to your aunts and uncles. You're the one. You're the one that God chose. And so embrace that and enjoy that. And you just leave the results to the Lord. Amen? So Father, thank you for Cornelius, for the word that you gave through us and just a great section of scripture. So encouraging to us, God. Help us to live up to your calling in our lives and and everything we learn today. Just be honored, be glorified. And perhaps you're here today and you need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you're, like you, I described you, you're bursting with belief. Well, I want to honor that in your life today. If you believe on the death, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ today, and you'd like to publicly acknowledge it, I'd invite you to do just that. So if you're here today, would you just stand to your feet and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus with my life. And I desire to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus not by a church, not by a man, not by an organization, not even by this church or this man. You are saved by the blood of Jesus. And is there anyone here today who would say, I want to be born again? Just stand to your feet right where you are. And I know God is with you. Who else would say yes? Today is the day. You guys out online and Listening on the radio, God sees you too. Like it's not about being in the room downstairs, in the overflow room or in the cafe. But like, this is it. And it requires like, I mean, you're, like your heart's beating so fast right now. It's because it's such a moment where you're releasing yourself to the truth of God's word. Bless you over here, brother. Who else would say that's me? Today's the day. God bless you in the back. I see you. I mean, what a powerful moment. We all came the same way. I mean, maybe not standing or in a church or anything, but we all came the same way. By grace, through faith. Don't forget where you came from. Bless you. Don't forget where you came from. If you would stay standing, I want people to come up with you. Would you stay standing? We got pastors moving around uh, to be sure that they can connect with you. Uh, we don't want you to, we want you to know you're not alone. So come on up, Enrique or Josh. Yeah, Josh, Enrique, you got here. So just pray with me wherever you might be. Again, we're going to give you the chance for the belief to confess. And you could say, God, I admit that I've sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe you sent Jesus to live for me, to die for me. And I believe he rose again from the dead to save my soul. And I turn away from my sins and ask you to forgive me and choose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.